Hello. Today's stories come from r slash entitled people. Ooh, all right. We have a special single long story today. It was posted to Best of Redditor updates, but I think you'll see exactly why it gets the entitled people subreddit treatment. One important thing to note, this was collated and reposted by user Rare Don't Stare from multiple posts and subreddits, with edits from me for video and clarity purposes. OP posted his story, then was directed to an Ask Reddit comment, then acted based on that and gave an update. For that reason, we will follow the same path back to a very iconic story from 2014 before the update. Our story starts with me with my girlfriend's family following my sudden inheritance. Feel like my life is shattering and lottery winnings thread. Note from user Rare Don't Stare. This is a really long post because I have included some relevant comments and advice, which are the real gem. And Best of Redditor Updates seems like an appropriate subreddit to compile the entire post. The advice included in the post is relevant for people receiving large inheritances, winning lotteries, or receiving other forms of windfall gains like settlements. Part 1. Original post by user Windfall Curse. Apologies in advance for the wall of incoming text. Where do I even begin? I'm so lost right now, I don't even know how to put things into words or find a good starting point. I guess it goes with how two months ago, my life was exactly where I wanted it to be. I've been with the girl of my dreams, 27-year-old female, for the last three and a half years. We have a house, animals, both of our families get along beautifully, and honestly, the last three years with her and my family and her family around the holidays have been some of the most warm, fuzzy memories I've had in my entire life. And believe me, I've been thinking about those times a lot lately. So like I said, this problem is going to come in parts because my entire life feels like it is on the brink of completely falling apart. My mother was a very wealthy woman. Most of my life, she and I did not get along very well. I started working in the family business roughly five years ago, and since then, we've developed a great relationship. It was one of those things where, after many years of feeling that my mother hated me, she was at last proud of me and not afraid to say she loved me and valued me. Then, last month in mid-March, she passed away. I'm tearing up thinking about this as I type because I've always felt that, despite her resentment towards me in my early years, I loved my mother more than anyone else in this world. I won't say much more than that. She had a hard life in spite of her wealth, and I feel I could write a whole book on our relationship. Anyway, she is gone, and my siblings and I are now extremely wealthy and have taken possession of the business and all of her investments and property. If that isn't scary enough, I'm having a hard time figuring out what I need to do next. The business I was associated with, I can handle, and my siblings and I have really come together on this, and they seem to trust me with that part of it. But it doesn't wash away the hurt and guilt I feel that I only got a few good years with the woman who gave me life. Anyway, my plan is to marry my girlfriend by next year and we've already discussed the prenup situation, which I will be getting due to my newfound wealth. She has been nothing but wonderful after my mom's death, but the problems come in her family. I won't go into much detail, but I love these people, like an extension of my own family. But they have already started trying to pry exactly how wealthy I am out of my girlfriend, and her mom has always had a gravitational pull towards, for lack of a better term, pyramid schemes. Her first sibling, Terry, just got married and is working a fast food job. Terry and his wife have decided they will be starting a family soon and stated that they want wife to be a stay-at-home mom. This talk has only recently popped up and been brought to my attention and, I feel like I'm being paranoid, been directed at me as there is absolutely no way they'd be able to afford this on the money they currently make or even while living in their small apartment. Like they are expecting me to help them out in a situation they are wholly unable to handle right now. Sibling number two, Leslie, has run into some pretty serious legal trouble and is also pregnant. The father has a history of abuse and neither have steady incomes. They have recently come back into our lives after a four-year-long absence between girlfriend and Leslie, though prior to this, the two have always been extremely close, as girlfriend is with all of her siblings as throughout their childhood, a lot of the time, all they had was each other. Sibling number three, Casey, 
who I hardly ever speak to, has even started chatting me up on Facebook more than she ever has in the entire time I've known her. Is this just my brain devolving into paranoia? Or is this actually happening? Like the lottery horror stories you hear where people come out of the woodwork with their hands out when they smell money on someone they know. I know for a fact my mother, for all of her faults, fell victim to this when she inherited this money. She became increasingly bitter throughout her life due to all of the husbands and friends that took advantage of her or what she could do for them. She drank herself stupid every day for 30 plus years and moved through carton after carton of cigarettes and alienated her own children. I don't want to be like that. I don't want that to happen. It's been less than a month that I've had more money than I know what to do with. I'm afraid to spend a dime or do anything with it because I feel like my girlfriend's family is only the beginning. What's worse, and will probably make me look like a total butthead, is my girlfriend has already committed to helping Leslie. They were close their whole lives, and with all of the legal trouble in pregnancy, girlfriend cries at night thinking about what's happening to her. She has not asked me to help financially or anything, but I have been there every step of the way to help support them and her as best as I can. But how will it look when my girlfriend starts giving out her money to people, while I don't? and get viewed as a selfish Scrooge. All of this is too much. The last three years were just so wonderful. So many magic trips to the beach, wonderful holidays surrounded by not one but two families of great people that accepted and loved me. And now it seems like, because I lost my mother and am getting a windfall because of it, everything is changing. I don't get to be happy with family anymore, and my whole life is crashing because of this. I know this is so far beyond a first world problem. Poor baby is now a multimillionaire and is a little sad he can't have a happy Christmas. Wah, wah. But I feel so broken. I miss my mom. I don't sleep at all. I hardly eat. And despite knowing full well the path my mother went down, I've been drinking a bit and smoking weed more than I ever had. On a daily basis, in fact. My siblings seem to be coping just fine. And now I feel like everyone is out to get me. Even my girlfriend is getting a little tired of hearing me voice my concerns over her siblings, one through three, and her mom's sudden extra interest in me, which is understandable. They are all very close and take up for one another. Now, I'm even doubting myself and thinking it's all in my head, maybe. Too many times my mother drunkenly telling me about all the times she trusted people and was let down. I'm just so lost. Part 2. Abridged In response to the OP's post, many commentators redirected him to one advice comment posted by user Blake Class in response to what to do after winning lottery that became known as the classic lottery winner post and goes as follows. Congratulations! You just won millions of dollars in the lottery. That's great. Now you're screwed. No, really, you are. You're totally screwed. If you just want to skip the biographical tales of woe of some of the math tax protagonists, skip on down to the next comment to see what to do in the event you win the lottery. You see, it's something of an open secret that winners of obnoxiously large jackpots tend to end up badly with alarming regularity. Not the $1 million winners, but anyone in the nine-figure range is at high risk. Eight figures? Pretty likely to be screwed. Seven figures? Yep. Painful. Perhaps this is a consequence of the sample. The demographics of lottery players might be exactly the wrong people to win large sums of money. Or, perhaps money is the root of all evil. Either way, you are going to have to be careful. Don't believe me? Consider this. Large jackpot winners face double-digit multiples of probability versus the general population to be the victim of homicide, something like 20 times more likely. Overdoses, bankruptcy. How's that for irony? Kidnapping. And triple-digit multiples of probability versus the general population rate to be convicted of drunk driving, the victim of homicide, at the hands of a family member, 120 times more likely in this case, ain't love grand, a defendant in a civil lawsuit, a defendant in felony criminal proceedings, believe it or not, your biggest enemy if you suddenly become possessed of large sums of money, is you. At least you will have the consolation of meeting your fate by your own hand. But if you can't manage it on your own, don't worry. There are any number of willing participants ready to help you start your vicious downward spiral for you. Mind you, many of these will be friends, friendly neighbors, or family. Often, they won't even have evil intentions. But, as I'm sure you know, that makes little difference in the end. 
Most aren't evil. Most aren't malicious. Some are. None are good for you. Jack Whitaker, a Johnny Cash attired West Virginia native, is the poster boy for the dangers of a lump sum award. In 2002, Mr. Whitaker, 55 years old at the time, won what was also at the time the largest single award jackpot in U.S. history, $315 million. At the time, he planned to live as if nothing had changed, or so he said. He was remarkably modest and decent before the jackpot, and his ship sure came in, right? Wrong. Mr. Whitaker became the subject of a number of personal challenges, escalating into personal tragedies, complicated by a number of legal troubles. Whitaker wasn't a typical lottery winner either. His net worth at the time of his winnings was in excess of $15 million, owing to his ownership of a successful contracting firm in West Virginia. His claim to want to live as if nothing had changed actually seemed plausible. He should have been well-equipped for wealth. He was already quite wealthy after all. By all accounts, he was somewhat modest, low-profile, generous, and good-natured. He should have coasted off into the sunset. Yeah, not exactly. Whitaker took the all-cash option, $170 million, instead of the annuity option, and took possession of $114 million in cash after $56 million in taxes. Then, things went south. Whitaker quickly became the subject of a number of financial stalkers who would lurk at his regular breakfast hideout to accost him with suggestions for spending his money. They were unemployed. No, an interview tomorrow morning wasn't good enough. They needed cash now. Perhaps they had a surefire business plan. Their daughter had cancer. A niece needed dialysis. Needless to say, Whitaker stopped going to his breakfast haunt. Eventually, they began ringing his doorbell, sometimes in the early morning. Before long, he was paying off-duty deputies to protect his family. He was accused of being heartless, cold, stingy, letters poured in, children with cancer, diabetes, MS, you name it. He hired three people to sort the mail, a detective to filter out the false claims, and the con men and women was retained. Brenda, the clerk who had sold Whitaker the ticket, was a victim of collateral damage. Whitaker had written her a check for $44,000 and bought her house, but she was by no means a millionaire. Rumors that the state routinely paid the clerk who had sold the ticket 10% of the jackpot winnings hounded her. She was followed home from work, threatened, assaulted. Whitaker's car was twice broken into by trusted acquaintances who watched him leave large amounts of cash in it. $500,000 and $200,000 were stolen in two separate instances. The thieves spiked Whitaker's drink with prescription drugs in the first instance. The second incident was the handiwork of his granddaughter's friends, who had been probing the girl for details on Whitaker's cash for weeks. Even Whitaker's good faith generosity was questioned. When he offered $10,000 to improve the city's water park so that it was more handicap accessible, locals complained that he spent more money at the strip club. Amusingly, this was true. Whitaker invested quite a bit in his own businesses, tripled the number of people his business employed, making him one of the larger employers in the area and eventually had given away $14 million to charity through a foundation he set up for the purpose. This is, of course, what you are supposed to do. Set up a foundation. Be careful about your charity giving. It made no difference in the end. To top it all off, Whitaker had been accused of ruining a number of marriages. His money made other men look inferior, they said. Wherever he went in the small West Virginia town he called home. Resentment grew quickly and festered. Whitaker paid four settlements related to this sort of claim. Yes, you read that right, four. His family and their immediate circle were quickly the victims of odds-defying numbers of overdoses, emergency room visits, and even fatalities. His granddaughter, the 18-year-old Brandy, who Whitaker had been giving a $2,100 per week allowance, was found dead after having been missing for several weeks. Her death was apparently from a drug overdose but Whitaker suspected foul play. Her body had been wrapped in a tarp and hidden behind a rusted-out van. Her 17-year-old boyfriend had expired three months earlier in Whitaker's vacation house, also from an overdose. Some of his friends had robbed the house after his overdose, 
stepping over his body to make their escape and then returning for more before stepping over his body again to leave. His parents sued for wrongful death, claiming that Whitaker's loose purse strings contributed to their son's death. Amazingly, juries are prone to award damages in cases such as these. Whitaker settled. Again. Even before the deaths, the local and state police had taken a special interest in Whitaker after his newfound fame. He was arrested for minor and less minor offenses many times after his winnings, despite having had a nearly spotless record before the award. Whitaker's high profile couldn't have helped him much in this regard. In 18 months, Whitaker had been cited for over 250 violations ranging from broken taillights on every one of his five new cars to improper display of renewal stickers. A lawsuit charging various police organizations with harassment went nowhere, and Whitaker was hit with court costs instead. Whitaker's wife filed for divorce, and in the process, froze a number of his assets and the accounts of his operating companies. Caesars in Atlantic City sued him for $1.5 million to cover bounced checks caused by the asset freeze. Today, Whitaker is badly in debt, and bankruptcy looms large in his future. But hey, that's just one example, right? Wrong. Nearly one-third of multi-million dollar jackpot winners eventually declare bankruptcy. Some end up worse. To give you just a taste of the possibilities, consider the fates of Billy Bob Harrell Jr., $31 million, Texas, 1997. As of 1999, committed suicide in the wake of incessant requests for money from friends and family. Quote, winning the lottery is the worst thing that ever happened to me. William Post, $16.2 $16.2 million, Pennsylvania, 1988. In 1989, brother hires a contract murderer to kill him and his sixth wife. Landlady sued for portion of the jackpot, convicted of assault for firing a gun at a debt collector, declared bankruptcy, dead in 2006. Evelyn Adams, $5.4 million, won twice, 1985, 1986. As of 2001, poor and living in a trailer, gave away and gambled most of her fortune. Suzanne Mullins, $4.2 million, Virginia, 1993. As of 2004, no assets left. Shafiq Talmadge, $6.7 million, Arizona, 1988. As of 2005, declared bankruptcy. Thomas Strong, $3 million, Texas, 1993. As of 2006, died in a shootout with police. Victoria Zell, $11 $11 million, 2001, Minnesota. As of 2006, broke, serving seven-year sentence for vehicular manslaughter. Karen Cohen, $1 million, Illinois, 1984. As of 2000, filed for bankruptcy. As of 2006, sentenced to 22 months for lying to federal bankruptcy court. Jeffrey Dampier, $20 million, Illinois, 1996. As of 2006, kidnapped and murdered by own sister-in-law. Ed Gilding, $8.8 million, Texas, 1993. As of 2003, dead. Wife saddled with his debts. As of 2005, wife sued by her own daughter who claimed that she was taking money from a trust fund and squandering cash in Las Vegas. Willie Hurt, $3.1 million, Michigan, 1989. As of 1991, addicted to cocaine, divorced, broke, indicted for murder. Michael Klingbeil, $2 $2 million, as of 1998, sued by own mother claiming he failed to share the jackpot with her. Janet Lee, $18 million, 1993, Missouri. As of 2001, filed for bankruptcy with $700 in assets. So, what the heck do you do if you are unlucky enough to win the lottery? This is the absolutely most important thing you can do right away. Nothing. Yes, nothing. Do not declare yourself the winner. Yet, do not tell anyone. The urge is going to be nearly irresistible. Resist it. Trust me. One, immediately retain an attorney. Two, decide to take the lump sum. Three, decide right now how much you plan to give to family and friends. Four, you will be encouraged to hire an investment manager. Considerable pressure will be applied. Don't. Five, If you elect to be more global about your paranoia, use between 20% and 33% of what you have not decided to commit to a family fund immediately to purchase a combination of longer-term U.S. treasuries, 5 or 10-year are a good idea, and perhaps even another G7 treasury instrument. This 
is your safety net. You will be protected from yourself. Six, that leaves, say, 80% of $91.2 million or $72.9 million. You have to invest in a low-fee index fund. Seven, so you have put a safety net in place. You have provided for your family beyond your wildest dreams, and you still have $36.4 million in cash. What now? Whatever you want. Go ahead and burn through $36.4 million in hookers and blow if you want. You've got more security than 99% of the country. Part 3. Update by OP user windfall curse on their post after they finished reading the recommended r slash ask reddit thread we just did as part 2. First, I just want to say, wow, this whole thing blew up and has made me feel much better about the whole situation. Thank you everyone for your understanding, condolences, and advice. I read the lottery winning thread many of you linked to, and while I'm not currently $300 million richer, I will look into a smaller scale version of all the things you offered up. I'm not sure if it's worth writing a whole update, but last night, I called my sister and drove an hour to her house and stayed the night with her, her husband, and my nieces and nephew. Over some beers, she and I started talking about the whole situation. Oddly, it's the first time we've really talked about anything alone, without attorneys or my other siblings around, since my mother died. Side note, she passed away on March 8th, and I know there was at least one comment that said this seemed like everything was moving too fast. Anyway, it turns out she isn't as together about everything as I thought she was. I showed her the thread and all of the replies and both she and I agreed to talk to a financial advisor and look into getting attorneys to help us with this. She had been primarily working with my mom's attorney up until now. I'm going to look into setting up a trust as well. Nothing too crazy, but enough that I can give small gifts to these people and have a cap on it, so to speak, for whenever it does come up. I talked to my girlfriend on the phone this morning and kind of laid it all out, and she was in total agreement. She said she was surprised Casey had suddenly started talking to me and that it was very suspicious. She also said that Terry's wife brought up the kids again and was showing her houses they wanted to get that were way out of their price range. And my girlfriend kind of played dumb and just kept asking questions about how they planned to afford all that. So I know she and I are, for now at least, on the same page. Lastly, when I was talking to my sister last night, she said something that both uplifted and destroyed me. We were talking about our mom and what a strong woman she was, and my sister said that one of the last conversations she had with her mom, my mother said, you and my brother trust Windfall Curse. He knows what he's doing, and he will make sure everyone is okay. Anyway, thank you all again for all of your comments. I feel like a better and stronger person just one day later. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I find these lottery stories so fascinating. I definitely don't think money is the root of all evil, but I do think it can bring out the worst in people through jealousy and greed. That's a them thing though, not a money thing. I really like that a huge focus for OP was that he actually had the opportunity to repair his relationship with his mom, highlighted by the sister share at the end. And the importance he placed on this shows he's got perspective and will likely take the right approach here. And it sounds like his girlfriend's on side. He's definitely better off than he originally thought. Let's check out some of the top comments. Done the Math said, Not sure how many times I've read that lotto post, but I'm apparently always up for reading it when it shows up. Green Velvet Cake too added, I always read it because a little part of my brain is convinced that'll be me one day. Warm Refrigerator added, Me too, and I don't play the lottery. Pink Knitted Blanket shared, Thanks for putting this together. It's actually kind of nice having a post here where someone has a problem that is totally outside of my realm of experience. I go, oh no, how will this turn out? And it turns out the answer is, person gets information and takes life one day at a time from there, with adequate and genuine love and support. Nice. Indigo Insane said, as OP described each family member, I could instantly match them to members of my own. Money changes people in sometimes very predictable ways. Ananas and Banana added, My relatives already planned out what I would buy them if I became rich. BB Please said, Same. I recently inherited a non-life-changing amount of money, and I already got the Jack just needs some help after getting out of jail for the third time sob story. And this person didn't even know I was left anything. She just guessed that I did. Anyways, if you inherit anything more than like 10k, keep it to yourself. 
people can do a complete 180 when money is involved. If you've enjoyed the story and would like to hear more, consider liking, subscribing, and leaving a comment. Thanks, and bye for now.